The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the individuals participating in the show. All persons described or mentioned in the podcast should be considered innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. This podcast contains subject matters such as violence and graphic descriptions along with adult language, which may not be suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. On the morning of January 5th, 2015, a 25-year-old man awakens suddenly with flu-like symptoms. His wife wakes up in the morning and he is completely vanished. Later, he's found deceased in one of the largest lakes in Georgia. But this lake has a storied history. Many mysterious events have transpired with many people speaking of a curse. You're listening to the Mysterious Bruise Podcast, and tonight we bring you the case of Kelly Nash and the Mysteries of Lake Lanier. Welcome to a deep, dark, dank, moist basement somewhere in the bowels of Georgia. So, Coachy, uh, you're looking all professional with that new mic stand you got there. Check two. Check two. We're getting Sibilous. all... Sibilous. <laughs> We're getting all professional. We're going to have to start uh, video and, or recording the videos of this so they can see how you're literally recording this at the foot of the cross. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It is true. You think I jest, but I do not jest. I only speaketh the truth. So uh, no new patrons to speak about, but we have some of the greatest patrons on the planet because Miss Priscilla Tatum today messaged us on Patreon and said, here is one for you boys, the Dardine family in Florida. Awful, awful, but never solved. My daughter is obsessed, and now am I. Love you guys. And so I responded, you're not going to believe this. But that case is dropping in two weeks. Yeah, that's our next one. Yeah. I was like, whoa. And so she responded with, wow, great minds think a lot. Can't wait to hear y'all's take on it. That's right. Because I ran, when I read the message, I was in class. And so I had the little sticky note of where we had the next three episodes, which were on two of three now. And I was like, I swear I think that's next. And sure enough, it was. So I was like, Give old Miss Tatum a shout out for being so in touch with us. All right, so no new business. So let's jump into this mysterious case we have this week. I know that's a shocker for some of you, but we are talking about the one and only. Kelly Hanson Nash, who was born on September 5th, 1989 in Oneida, Alabama, to parents Beverly and Alan Nash. Now, Kelly would go on to graduate from Lakeview Academy in 2008 and was attending Georgia Gwinnett College, majoring in accounting. He was working at his father's construction business, J. Allen Custom Homes, and had been working there for 14 months. Kelly was also dating Jessica Sexton, and the two had been an item for three years and had recently moved into a house together on Jimmy Dodd Road in the city of Buford, Georgia. Now, Which this house. A storied history. Yeah. Oh. Now, this house was just 2.5 miles from Kelly's father's house. On January 5th, 2015, Kelly woke up with what his girlfriend Jessica described as cold. That's cold and flu put together. It's cooled. <laughs> cold and flu symptoms. He was sneezing, <laughs> coughing, and said he wasn't feeling well. Kelly had been suffering from recurring sinus infections and had slept on the couch so that his girlfriend could get a good night's sleep before going to work. I need the, oh. It's very nice of him, I yes. mean, seriously. It is. Not many of them gentlemen left out there. Because if you're going to wake up with a coughing, sneezing, headache, Whatever the NyQuil slogan used to be. It's too bad you can't get the good NyQuil anymore. What you mean the good NyQuil? What, the one with the heroin in it? No, the stuff that you make <laughs> meth out of. They had to take that methamphetamine stuff out of it. 
Oh, man, they take the fun out of everything. I know. So at 3.30 a.m., Jessica woke up to find Kelly in the living room playing video games on his Xbox. He told her he still wasn't feeling well and couldn't sleep. Jessica said that she said okay and headed back to bed. She wakes up at 7.30 that morning to let the dogs out and go to work. Kelly, however, is not in the living room. The video game he had been playing earlier that morning was Idle. Wait, so I screwed up the intro then because I said he woke up suddenly. This dude was up. (laughs) (laughs) Whoopsie. And she was shocked to find Kelly was nowhere to be found. She found his cell phone wallet with his ID, keys to his truck, all left where he usually leaves them. The only thing that was missing was his Glock 9mm handgun containing a single magazine. Now, Jessica... Con- oh, well, some of my research said a single clip, and I was like, oh, come on, y'all. I know. I, I, I know. I, I saw the same thing, and I was like, we are going to I correct thought, the wrong. I thought of you when I saw it. I was like, oh, he going to catch that one. And I did. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica contacts Kelly's parents to see if they had... Heard from him, and they state they had not. After explaining the circumstances from the night before, the family contacts the authorities and reports Kelly missing. Now, at the time he went missing, Kelly was six foot two inches tall and weighed 230 pounds. I put that little nugget in there to remind everyone that short of someone holding a gun on this man, he's not going to be abducted. That's a big no. boy. That's a big old boy. Now, when describing Kelly to authorities and the media, his family stated that he had a non-aggressive, always-wanting-to-please personality. His mom recalls that he became upset when he showed her his first tattoo, thinking that she was going to be disappointed in, in him. Quote, He saw what he wanted in life, his father Alan said. He had figured it out and was working to get there. Strong relationships were what he wanted in life. Kelly wasn't driven by money, but by doing the things the right way, end quote. Now, family and friends insist that Kelly was not the type to simply just vanish or disappear. And officials with the Gwinnett County Police Department said they were trying to piece together a timeline of exactly what Kelly was doing in the hours before he went missing. They did find a surveillance video of Kelly at a gas station around the corner from his house located at the intersection of Buford Dam Road and Little Mill Road around 9 p.m. the night before he went missing, picking up items while on the phone with his girlfriend. But nothing in the footage was out of the ordinary, and, of course, Kelly returned home shortly thereafter. Now, the family decided to hire a private investigator to look into the possibility of Kelly being associated with a, quote, less than reputable crowd. The private investigator conducted numerous searches and interviewed several people and came to the conclusion that nothing in Kelly's life was suspicious. Kelly's father, Alan, stated, quote, This is the problem. We can't find anything bad that Kelly was associated with, and we have tried. You're trying to find a starting point. Is there something that he was doing that none of us, the family members, would know about? This was not a young man tied up in some dark underworld situation. Alan, it's hard for the family if they, you know, you can keep secrets from your family, but once you, once they start really, really digging, it, something's going to come to light if there's something there. So the fact that they found nothing, pretty strange. Well, and it speaks volumes about his family as well. I mean, a lot of people have those rose-colored glasses on when they're talking about their children, and for the family to be like, you know what, let's turn over every rock we can. Let's get a private investigator. Let's see if he was into something he wasn't supposed to. And so kudos to them. Now, Alan would go on to tell the news media that Kelly had no history of mental illness or drug abuse. So that was kind of ruled out at the onset. A question early in the investigation, however, was did Kelly walk to get medicine for his sinuses or try to go to his dad's house the morning in question? Now, a nearby convenience store, and it is not stated whether it was the same one he had frequent or he was at the day before, revealed a shadowy figure at 4.30 a.m. on the morning of January 5th of the day Kelly disappeared. 
The footage, however, was too dark and grainy to identify the individual. I know that's a shocker. So was he just lurking outside? or? Well, it just shows from what I, I never saw the footage, but the way it was described in numerous articles is just basically you can tell it's a person that just walks by the field of view of the camera, and that's it. You can't tell yeah. gender, height, weight, nothing. Well, you can't assume their gender. Well, that's true. It could have been a you day really, them. You just can't. Not anymore. <laughs> I will, side tangent, I will say this. If Apple bans Aretha Franklin song about more than a woman. What are you talking about? You've not heard it. They're trying to cancel Aretha Franklin's. Oh, they shut up. I swear to God, I'll send you the dang article as soon oh, as we're done. God. So you can, so your blood pressure can get as high as mine. I was like, really? She was singing about how great it was to be a woman. She wasn't saying that only women could be great. She was saying, if you feel like a woman, feel like a woman. So does Shania Twain. That's right. They ain't going after her yet, but she is Canadian, so they kind of stay away from them. <laughs> she even said, man, I feel like a woman. So, Oh, she doubled down. They, yeah, they need to cancel doubled. her for sure. <laughs> <laughs> now, the store in, in question with the grainy footage is on the way to Kelly's house or Kelly's father's house. But the question is, why would he have walked to his dad's house house without his belongings in the middle of a cold January night? Alan would go on news channels in the local area and beg the community to come forward. Quote, it's basically impossible to know if that was Kelly. If someone knows that that was him in that video, I would love for them to come forward so we could at least no one way or the other, end quote. Now, the missing gun did raise suspicions, and a question was posed that maybe Kelly heard something outside while playing his video game and grabbed his pistol to go investigate. Jessica would tell authorities that she did notice the garage door, which the couple used to exit and enter the home, was left slightly open. With the gun missing, and after noticing that his video game had gone idle, Jessica speculated that he could have briefly stepped outside. None of these elements indicated a crime, but they did seem strange to his family. Now, what does it mean by idle? Does it mean that it went... I, the way I kind of... For a while, they'll go into rest mode, but that takes like, depending on how it's set, half an hour or so. Well, the way I was kind of read into it was, it was almost like he paused it, and it was on like the Paul screen, but what, yeah, do I, you know what he was playing? No. PlayStation, Xbox. Yeah, Xbox. He was playing the Xbox. Oh, well, I don't know Xbox. I just know PlayStation. So I was just trying to figure out if you could at least get some idea of how long he'd been gone. No, I know the, my PlayStation will go into rest mode after like thirty minutes. The Xbox will start darkening the screen, or. If you now, if you leave the game in a like a rest area, say you're playing Call of Duty or something like that, and it's you're just hiding behind something, it'll stay lit up forever, I guess. Uh, but if you pause it, the screen will start going dark and then come back to light, kind of like a slow fade in, fade out. I'm sure there's probably some way they could have gotten into that Xbox and found out when it was paused, but I didn't see that in my research. That'd be above my pay grade. How way, to do that. Above, way above mine. So let's <laughs> go over the old timeline one more time. So on January 4th, 2015, around 9 p.m., Kelly is seen on CCTV purchasing cold medicine at a gas station near his house. He's on the phone with Jessica at the time. He returns home. Jessica says he sleeps on the couch that night because he's coughing and sneezing, and he did not want to keep her awake all night knowing that she had to work the next morning. January 5th, just before 3.30 a.m., a 28-second voicemail is left on Jessica's phone from Kelly's phone. Now, the call is possibly, probably, highly susceptible to being a butt dial because Kelly was in the house, and Jessica gets up just after the call to find him on the couch playing Xbox. She did state that the voice message only had a few muffled words and sounds, nothing out of the ordinary. But again, keep in mind, right after that's when she gets up and he is on 
the couch playing Xbox. So that kind of can be thrown away. January 5th, 4.20 a.m., this is when someone is captured on the gas station's exterior CCTV walking down the road. This is the same gas station where Kelly purchased cold medicine the night before. The person seen walking could have been Kelly, but the footage, again, is too grainy to make out the description of the person walking. Still on January 5th, around 7.30 a.m., Jessica wakes up to let the dogs out and notices that Kelly is gone. She finds his truck, wallet, phone, car keys, and coat are still inside. Now, keep in mind, the weather details for January 5th, 2015, stated that it was 32 degrees outside that evening, and Jessica states that she last saw Kelly wearing thin pajama pants and a T-shirt. So it's not like he's going to get up and just take off for a stroll. Yeah, it was probably not extremely cold if somebody was from, you know, Wisconsin, somewhere like that. But him being from Alabama and living in Georgia, he was probably freezing. Yes. And I will say this. My brother-in-law is from upstate New York, and he has gone on record saying that a sub-freezing temperature around here feels like the teens up there because we have that cold, humid winter air. That's right. It's not the heat, it's the humidity that I get you. It's in the always about the humidity, whether the sun's out or whether it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so a month later, on February 8th, 2015, a man is fishing in Lake Lanier near Shadburn Ferry Road in a cove directly behind Kelly Nash's father's house, and he discovers a badly decomposed body. He calls the authorities, and on February the 10th of 2015, Gwinnett County Police released a statement confirming that the body of the fisherman found was that of Kelly Nash. Now, he was found wearing the same clothes that Jessica stated that he had on when she last saw him on the couch. His clothing and tattoos helped to positively identify the body as Kelly. It was later released that Kelly had died from a gunshot wound to the head and drowning. Now, what was it a nine millimeter? See, I could never find it because all the articles I, I found either, stated that they had not released the coroner's port. So I, everything, and, I, yeah, everything I saw did not say suicide, nor did it say it was nine millimeter. So that leads me to believe that there's more to it. Oh, I would agree. Now, police would state that Kelly's death was not the result of foul play and was more than likely the result of an accident or possible suicide. But depending on where... I didn't even see anything that said suicide. I, I just saw possible accident, which I thought was very strange. Well, and the other thing is this. You have to, and I'm not saying it's never happened, but I would dare go on record and state that 95% of all suicides, they don't put the gun to the back of their head. They Remember, they accused Chuck Morgan of committing suicide by shooting himself in the back of the head. Yeah, but we all and know there, that's There was bold. that one guy that tried to fool the insurance people by tying the gun to a balloon and then shooting himself in the back of the head. The balloon took off with the gun. Like I said, I would go as high as 95%. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, of all the suicides in the world, I gave you two valid examples. I mean... They were... <laughs> textbook cases of people really using their head too. <laughs> yeah, literally, that's literally. What the bullet went yeah. Hurt. So a 17 year old girl who lived on the same cove where Kelly's body was found, took a picture of his body and posted it to her Twitter account. What? Yeah. In that's one all. of the rare moves before Elon took over, Twitter took the picture down, but supposedly the photo showed that fish had gathered around the top slash back of Kelly's head that would indicate the site of the gunshot wound. So yeah. rumors and innuendo abound. And these are uns unsubstantiated. So keep that in mind when I tell you these rumors, okay? They're unsubstantiated. But early on in the investigation, there were newspaper reports that Kelly had been spotted in a bad part of town the day before his disappearance, and he had a burner cell phone. But, like I said previously, the family hires a private investigator, and they can't find anything of the such. Now, after his body was found, a local 
commented online that Kelly had been shot in the head and his feet were bound. Again, nothing I could find stated anything about his feet being bound. Now, there are rumors that Jessica found his body and not the fisherman, which we can pretty much put that one to bed. Yeah. Someone on Web Sleuth stated that the post, the person making the post's father knew Kelly's father, Alan Nash. And according to the Web Sleuther's father, Kelly was scheduled to testify in an upcoming murder trial. But again, I go back to the family hiring a private investigator. That would have come out in the newspaper. Yeah, they talk about those sort of things. Yeah, they kind of. That's kind of important when you find a body with a gunshot wound in the back of the yeah, head. That would be what we call sensational news, and I promise you the the news outlets in Georgia would have been all over it. Yes, yes, they would have. Now, many people don't believe Jessica's version of events and questioned her responses in interviews. She supposedly had a previous drug problem, and just a few months after Kelly's death, her Facebook was scrubbed clean, and she was in love with someone else. Which I don't find that real plausible. I could almost see her possibly making a new Facebook page just because she didn't want to be remembered of pictures and stuff with Kelly. But I just, I don't see, I mean, we have some some goofy police departments in this great state. But Gwinnett County, where this occurred, is upper echelon, upper crust white. So... it's the rich part. It's the rich neighborhoods of Atlanta, uh, suburbs of Atlanta. Yes. Like with, uh, oh, what's the other one? Uh, over by five points. What's that one called? Uh, Buckhead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't forget that. I don't know. I ain't allowed there. It's probably why. That's nah, probably so. My <laughs> wife ain't allowed there either. She likes to take shots. Not in the arm. They come in little <laughs> liquid forms. Anyway, back to the story. Ten years before Kelly's disappearance, Jessica was going through a separation with her previous husband when he died in a suspicious car wreck. Now, some members of his family have commented they suspect Jessica was involved. I don't think it was ten years before. I think that's a misprint. I think it was ten years after. That would make more sense because, hell, he was, what, 20? He was born in 89. He's 25. Yeah, so she got married at 15? No, I don't think so. So I think that that is more likely 10 years after Kelly's death, not before. Now. What what was 10 years after? What? What I had found when this was one of the crazy rumors was that 10 years after Kelly's disappearance, Jessica was going through a separation with a new husband when he died in a suspicious, a suspicious car wreck. Some members of his family have commented they suspect Jessica was involved. But again, that whole trail goes cold when you try to chase that rabbit. So we can't really, like, there's no information on the circumstances of the car wreck? No, there's nothing. Yeah, except, I guess, the family's like, you know, like she, break, she had something to do. Breaks cut, like what? Like, I don't see. That's the thing. There's that's all there's, that's out there. It's just that one blurb. Huh? They don't even give her new husband's name, what her name changed to, nothing. So, I really don't think there's much to that one either. Now, a Reddit poster stated that a pump at the gas station that Kelly walked by was set on fire the same night Kelly went missing. Now, that would be pretty easy to kind of just you know figure out whether or not that's true but again i didn't see anything in the great news articles and news coverage from 11 live in atlanta that stated that that had happened but so when you think this case is just an odd occurrence in gwinnett county georgia on lake lanier we have the disappearance of samuel waters Hmm. now Samuel Waters just happened to be 21 at the time he disappeared and was anticipating the birth of his first child. 
His girlfriend was expecting to give birth in February, and he had already gotten a tattoo of his daughter's name, Althea, to commemorate his firstborn. Hmm. On January 4th of 2015, the day before Kelly goes missing, an hour after Kelly is seen at the gas station buying cold medicine, Samuel went on a beer run to a convenience store with his friend, Jeffrey Mulder. Samuel did not return from said beer run, and his family has not seen him since that time. Hmm. Jeffrey would tell police that Samuel asked to be let out of the vehicle near Hurricane Shoals Road. During the investigation, police discovered that Samuel's cell phone had pinged off a tower near Lake Lanier on the night he went missing. Now, Samuel's grandparents lived close to this tower, but they stated that they did not see or speak with him that night. In August of 2015, police would serve a search warrant on a house on Shadburn Ferry Road. This house just happened to be Jeffrey Mulder's uncle's house, and law enforcement would remove the contents of a burn barrel from the property. Investigators believe that Samuel Waters was the victim of a homicide and that he died at the Shadbury Farm or Shadbury Ferry property. However, his body has never been recovered, so no charges have been filed. So to recap there, if you missed it, we have Samuel Waters going missing on January 4th at 10 p.m. That's one hour after Kelly is seen on CCTV buying cold medicine. This is on six and a half hours between disappearances. So basically they're theorizing that Kelly went missing around 4.30 a.m. Samuel supposedly asked to be let out of the truck at 10 p.m. Kelly's body was found in the cove behind his father's house, and Kelly's father's house just so happens to be on the same road, only five or six houses up on the other side of the street from where authorities removed the burn barrel looking for Samuel's remains. Hmm. Are Kelly and Samuel's death connected somehow? Does I mean, Kelly's if not? That's pretty damn coincidental. Coincidental, right there. Yeah, it's crazy. Did Kelly's girlfriend know more than she claimed to know? Come on, now we don't know that. We can't make that accusation. I'm just saying we're gonna get hate mail again because we're not victim blaming. But that is one of the theories: is that she knew something more than she has said. I don't well, believe so. Always gonna. I mean, that's always going to be a theory. I agree, but I don't believe that that has any weight to it because, again, I go back to the private investigator. Kelly's family really did a good job of trying to make sure they uncovered everything they possibly could. So if something was going on, I'm pretty confident that they would have known if she had been lying about something. So I, too, disagree with that question. Well, I mean, they always, you can't fault any law enforcement for suspecting the significant other. No, that's the first person you start with. Always. Yes. First person. You know why? Because it typically is, but there's no evidence to that. We can. And I think authorities don't have any evidence and have since moved on as well. She's not a person of interest. She's not been stated that she's a person of interest in the, in the case. So again, we can put that claim to bed. Now yeah, you better before you get some hate mail. I'm telling you, in it Ke- ain't fun. I've had it. <laughs> in Kelly's, I've had it happen. <laughs> in Kelly's case, certain web sleuthers have postulated that Kelly could have been suffering from what is known as the Werther effect. You may ask yourself right now, Arlo, what the hell is the Werther effect? Well, you're in luck, ladies and gentlemen, because I found it. Hey guys, Arlo here, and if you are struggling with the old caffeine in the morning, I have got the fix for you. It is called Magic Mind, and it is just a little two-ounce shot that you drink with your coffee or your energy drinks in the morning. It is chocked full of greatness, and it will get you focused, and it really actually has the L-theanine, And that lowers your cortisol hormone, which helps absorb that caffeine that you're intaking. 
Now, Magic Mind has nootropics, adaptogens, matcha green tea, and 12 magical ingredients. That matcha boosts your energy. The adaptogens help with relaxation, and the nootropics keep you focused. A bonus is that it has vitamins C and D along with the echinacea to help your immunity. So head over to magicmind.co backslash brews and enter the promo code BREWS20. That is brews20, BREWS20. And that will give you a 20% off coupon for either a one time purchase or or subscription to a monthly dose of Magic Mind. If you act now and you are using our code within the first 10 days, you can stack that code with one on their website and get up to 45% off. So head over once again to magicmind.co backslash brews and enter the code brews20, B-R-E-W-S-2-0. The Werther Effect dates back to the high number of suicides after the publication of, I'm going to screw this up, G-O-E-T-H-E Goths, The Sorrows of Young Werther in 1774. It describes the apparition of copycat suicides after media reports on suicides. Scientifically, it was first described in 1974 by David Phillips, whose study until today has been considered to be a pioneer work and constitutes a starting point for a large number of further studies. In this context, the way the media reporting has proved to be highly relevant. For this reason, the WHO published guidelines in 2001 determining exactly what to avoid when reporting about a suicide in the media. This includes precise details on the method of suicide, personal information on the person having committed suicide, or some expressions such as, quote, self-inflicted death, end quote. Instead, if a report focuses on resource-oriented aspects, this may possibly even lead to a reduction of suicide rates. This is then called the Papageno effect, which was first empirically confirmed in 2010 by an Australian work group headed by Thomas this one is, sorry to our German-speaking listeners, but I am going to absolutely destroy this one. <laughs> it is Nieder Krothenthaler. I think I did pretty good. That's the last time I'll say that. That Thomas, sounds pretty good. Yeah. That Thomas? You did pretty good. I'll give you a little credit. Okay, good. So Thomas, as he will now be, I'm probably way off, but Thomas is how he will now be referred to. States that in his study, unmistakably indicate indications that the prevention of suicidal behavior by the media is possible. For example, by presenting a successful coping with crisis following the report of suicide. Other factors have having suicide prevention effects include the mentioning of professional health services or publication of warning signals and backgrounds listed in the WHO guidelines. Prevention, however, can also take place at another level. Expert interviews carried out by authors revealed that the still existing treatment of suicidality as a taboo represents a huge problem. As a result, the bereaved not only experience the loss of a loved one, but also do not receive help or understanding from the environment. Consequently, further copycat suicides may occur without any medial impact. Therefore, it must be a matter of importance to counteract this tabooing since su suicidality is part of our society and should neither be ignored nor stigmatized. Only if it is discussed openly, possibilities for prevention can be detected and developed further. And I happen to agree with all that jargon. Basically, don't glorify and don't give out details. But that is the Werther effect. And that was a huge thread on Reddit. Like, it was almost a sub-thread of Kelly's thread. So now, ladies and gentlemen, that we have tickled your fancy with two unexplained 
Yeah, but we ain't got theories or nothing, man. There ain't any. any. (laughs) What do you mean? (laughs) I'm just joking. Um, (laughs) I think if you go back to Kelly's case, there was a theory out there that he had some kind of crazy reaction to the cold medicine he bought, and people kind of attacked the person that posted it, but I will give the person that posted the original one credit. They did go back and state that he could have bought what he considered to be cold medicine that was a knockoff brand that was available at the gas station that had something in it that, say, a name brand wouldn't, and he had an adverse reaction to that and wandered off in the middle of the night. But that still doesn't explain how he got shot in the back of his head and the fact that his Glock 9mm with the magazine in it has yet to be found. What I'm saying is, you can call it, you can say the cold medicine caused him to freak out. The dude's like 25. There's no way he's taking that particular cold medicine for the first time ever. What are the odds of that? Oh, I agree with you. That's just people on there. And then that kind of expounded into people who had never had adverse reactions to say, let's just say for an example would be to say Tylenol, cold and sinus that all of a sudden they take it and they have like the hives or they start sweating. So, but again, that doesn't, that is not a reaction that would cause one to just wander off in the middle of the night and shoot themselves in the back of the head. Well, yeah, it would make sense if, if he did it himself, that gun would probably have been found on the, the, the shore. Well, the you would, of the lake. yeah, you would at least, depending on where that cove is and proximity of the cove, whether or not they tracked him entering the water, that kind of stuff. Um, I'm pretty sure they did a cursory search and tried to find the Glock, but came up with naught. Hmm. Now, as for the other one that we discussed, the case of Mr. Samuel Waters, it's probably a high probability that his friend Jeffrey Mulder did something with him. Especially if the cops are taken out a burn barrel. So, unfortunately, though, there has been no leeway in either case. Yeah, but I keep going back to Kelly. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. You left in the middle of the night. Ends up shot in the back of the head. What could have possibly happened? The only thing that I could think, and this doesn't make sense because it's one of those theories where you you try to explain something but only come up with more questions. I like the fact that with the door being left open, maybe he heard something outside, went out to investigate, and then something happened. But again, you would think if that was the case and it was a home invasion robbery, they would have taken something not just Kelly. So that doesn't really answer any questions. Like, I mean, you think he just stumbled onto the wrong people or you think he might've been involved in something? Well, one of the theories out there was that Kelly heard something at his house, walked out and this is totally unsubstantiated. So take this with a grain of salt, heard something, walked out And he just happens to see Jeffrey Mulder and Samuel Waters getting into an argument outside of the vehicle. And Mulder does something to Waters, hits him or something like that, looks up, sees Kelly, pulls a gun on Kelly. But that, again, you would think there'd be a shootout in the middle of the night. Hmm. But again, there's nothing to tie Mulder back to Kelly's case. Yeah, but there's no. I didn't. I mean, were there any reports of gunshots that no, night? Or, no, there's a not shootout. That could, That's going to get some police attention, I would assume. Right. The only other thing that someone theorized was that maybe that did transpire. Kelly saw Jeffrey hit Samuel. He goes down there to check on Samuel thinking that Jeffrey's gotten back in the truck and is about to pull away, but Jeffrey goes in and gets a gun, comes around the corner, pops him in the back of the head, throws his body and Samuel's body in the back of the vehicle, dumps Kelly in the lake, takes Samuel to his uncle's place, and disposes of the body in the burn barrel. But again, 
If you're going to dispose of a body in the burn barrel, why not dispose of two bodies in the burn barrel? If you're going to dump one body in the lake, dump both bodies in the lake. So it doesn't really hold a lot of water. No, it doesn't because a burn barrel is not going to get rid of bodies. I mean, crematoriums have difficulty incinerating bodies. Unless they're in Chatsworth and they just put them in the lake. Damn burn barrel. You know, if you own that Chatsworth crematorium, they just really they just kind of forego that whole putting them in the incinerator. They just put them in the lake. That's Lafayette, bro. Chatsworth Lafayette, same thing. No, it ain't. <laughs> I mean, they're close. I can assure you. Oh, I, trust me. I know. I know. I'm poking the bear. <laughs> <laughs> still not going though you can't make me it ain't happening <laughs> rob from cigar store idiot said that he would love to go and he has bad knees and hips so that if anything shitty went down or spooky that you could at least outrun him if someone was gonna die bro if i can outrun him he don't need to be walking <laughs> he needs to take it easy give him one of them rascals we get him one of them scooters, one of them little mopeds, one of them electric bikes. <laughs> That's the new thing for hunters, electric bikes. They're like $4,000. I'm like, for $4,000, I'll go get some meth heads four-wheeler. Yeah, no doubt. Actually, I'll go get me one of them 1976 Ford You probably Rangers. get two. I want one of them little Suzuki flatbed trucks that's got no nose on the front of it. That's what I want. If I ever make it, I'm getting me one. Because you can buy two of them. I, I looked into this a couple of years ago. You can buy two of them for like $8,000. And people always buy two because when one shits the bed, you just use the other one. And then you part the one that shits the bed out to fix the one when it shits the bed. Yeah. If you ever watched Duck Dynasty, Jace had one and the brakes went out. So he always put it in neutral and ran it into a pine tree to get it to stop. <laughs> that may be the best episode short of Cy telling about the Black Panther I've ever seen. Oh, but anyway, okay. So back to the the episode. So <laughs> as Coach alluded to in the opening, Lake Lanier is not just some ski lake in North Georgia where the rich go to play. It is it, in the north. Like, being from Georgia, man, everybody knows. Man, be careful when you go to Lake Lanier. Bad things happen to people at Lake Lanier. And there's tons of bodies in Lake Lanier. Yes. Lake Lanier lies in the northern part of the great state of Georgia and sprawls out amongst the foothills of the North Georgia mountains for 26 miles. Mm Mm-hmm. Deep at its, well, I'm sorry, it's 75. Five meters, which here in America we equate that to 258 feet deep at its deepest point. The area is 59 square miles of water and 1,100. No, I misquoted that. 692 miles of shoreline. And it is called Lake Sydney Lanier, commonly referred to as just Lake Lanier. It is a man-made reservoir, and Lake Lanier is the largest lake in Georgia and even sports a chain of islands that were originally large hills before they flooded the valley. Now, the origins go back to 1948 when the U.S. government purchased a 100-acre farm from a river ferry operator by the name of Henry Shadburn in order to start a water project on the Chattahoochee River for the purpose of providing the city of Atlanta with hydroelectricity, flood control, and water supply. In 1950, the U.S. Car, no, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers began breaking ground and constructing the Buford Dam on the Chattahoochee River. And that dam would be completed in 1956, and they would begin the process of flooding them foothills. So the creation of Lake Lanier had problems from the very beginning. Funding for the project faced numerous hurdles, which stopped and started construction to the point where it is amazing that it actually finished on schedule. Additionally, the Corps of Engineers 
as well as the states which use the Apalachicola, Chattahoochee, Flint River Basin, and Alabama, Coosa, Tallapoosa River Basin, comprised of Florida, Georgia, and Alabama, all bitched at each other over water flow requirements, consumption caps, how the water should be used, and whether to give it priority as a water supply, hydroelectricity source, or even recreation. All of this while trying to juggle the federal laws that demanded water be set aside for threatened or endangered species that lived in or around the Chattahoochee River. Now, the states of Alabama and Florida were particularly pissed about how the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers regulated the water flow from Lake Lanier to the states. There was even debate over what the lake should be called, with the builders finally settling on the name of the great poet, Sidney Lanier. Now, there was the rather destructive nature of the lake's creation, and that goes to state that the U.S. government began a mad dash to ravenously purchase land from private companies, farmers, and anyone else who lived in the area that would inevitably wind up underwater. During the five years it took for the lake to completely fill to its intended water level, the government would buy up over 50,000 acres of prime farmland and pristine wilderness, moving more than 250 families, 15 businesses, and even relocating 20 cemeteries along with their corpses in the process. Now, that is up for debate because they say that there are several of those cemeteries they did not remove the corpses from. I mean, I don't know how you want to start a curse, but burying a cemetery under a vast amount of water is a good way to start. Yes. Now, what's even crazier is they say that as the process of the lake filling up, the nooks and crannies of the foothills filled with water, of course, but that spread devoured entire towns along with their buildings and houses, farmland, fields, bridges, toll gates, historical landmarks, river ferry businesses, a racetrack called Looper Speedway, country roads, forests, and other lakes. Many of the structures that would be inundated by the floodwaters filling up Lake Lanier were simply left as is. They never did destroy them. So if you were able to get to the bottom of the lake and look around, it would be like an underwater ghost town, complete with roads, walls, houses, everything. So, yeah, the fish down there don't swim alone if you get what I'm laying down. <laughs> they say no, they, do not. they say that even the ferries that were put out of business are still at the bottom of the lake. So over the years, there has been crazy stories and a crazy amount of deaths associated with the lakes, ranging from boating accidents, drownings, a number of uh, drivers who have lost control of their vehicles and careened off the road, crashed into the water. There's various stories of boats hitting something in the water only for it to turn out that there was nothing there. Boats or other watercraft capsized for no apparent reason, and sudden dangerous rogue waves seem to come out of nowhere without warning and just travel across the whole surface. Many of the drowning cases that are recorded are somewhat odd in that they have happened very close to shore with strong swimmers in calm conditions, which, considering the history of the lake, has given rise that it is haunted and cursed. I mean, we didn't even, you didn't even mention the fact, you know, the Cherokee lived there for many, 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 many years and were asked to, well, let's not say asked. Yeah, they don't, they didn't do that much. The U.S. government didn't do that much asking. They, yeah, let's, asking would probably be the wrong word to describe what happened to I them. I think you but, misspelled told. Yeah. <laughs> they were voluntold to, you know, skedaddle. Well, they have interviewed some people that have almost drowned and lived to tell the tale, and they tell of feeling as if they were actually being pulled underwater or held underwater by something or someone or 
having the air suddenly seem to leave their lungs and cause exhaustion in a matter of milliseconds. Now, people who drown fairly close to shore have had their bodies turn up in positions way away from where they died, which is probably due to the currents, but when mixed with the old ghost tales, uh, I don't want to go swimming. So in 2011 alone, there were 17 deaths on the lake. In 2012, it continued, and there was many horrific and violent injuries, which made national news, the first of which happened on June 18, 2012, when a nine-year-old Jake Prince and his brother Griffin, 13, were riding a pontoon out on the lake and were struck and killed by a speeding boat driven by a Johns Creek business owner. Weeks after that, on July 9th, another 11-year-old who happened to be the son of Usher's ex-wife, Tamika Forster, our foster, was struck while riding an inner tube by a family acquaintance riding a jet ski. And the list goes on and on and on and on. Uh, there was, I was, there was one more than I wanted to talk about. We talk about how James Hetfield hurt his back and ruined the dang concert I went to back in 1999. <laughs> Go ahead. Tell it. Tell it like it is, brother. I just told it. He was skiing on Lake Lanier and he hurt his back and he didn't show up to the show. The only time I've ever been there was my college roommate had moved up there for his job and he went to Southern Poly when it was still still Southern Poly and one of his fraternity brothers and him had gotten into a sailing club. So they took me and my wife out sailing. And even that day it was beautiful until we got on the lake and then it started raining and the wind picked up and I was like, no, nah, I don't want no part of this. Yeah. Let's just go back and eat. So, yeah, it's a little crazy, cray in the Ray Ray. Now, there was a, this was the case I wanted to talk about. There was a 16-year-old Gainesville High School student by the name of Hannah True Love who went missing from an apartment complex near Lake Lanier where she lived with her mother on the morning of August 12th. I'm sorry, August 24th, 2012. The following day, her body was found in a flooded area, I'm sorry, wooded area by the lakeside by another resident of the apartment complex. Hannah had been stabbed multiple times, yet it was unclear if the wounds were life-threatening and the actual cause of death remained elusive, although authorities were able to rule out drowning. She's found in a lake, stabbed multiple times, and she doesn't drown, but they have yet to name a cause of death. What makes the case creepier was a series of tweets Hannah had made on Twitter shortly before her death that expressed discontent with her life at the apartment complex and her fear of a stalker with one chilling tweet allegedly stating, quote, so scared right now, end quote. Um, mm-mm, mm-mm. Nope, nope, nope. You ain't going to catch me out there. And um, the buddy of mine that no. was with the, did the selling thing, uh, he's been trying to get me and another friend of ours to come up there and go striper fishing. I'm like, mm, I'm okay, man. I'm good. No, I don't. I've I've been out there a few times, and it's it's not something I'm willing to do again. Not now that I know what I know. You yeah. just it's not smart. No, in April of 1950, don't, don't risk it. I'm not risking it for the biscuit. I can tell you that. <laughs> in April of 1958, a young woman who worked at Riverside Military Academy, Miss Delali. Delia Parker Young and her friend Susie Roberts headed off to Three Gables in Dawsonville in Susie's 1954 Ford for a night out on the town and would never return. The investigation into their disappearance discovered that they had visited a gas station that night and left without paying. The only clue left at the scene was a set of skid marks across the road, which seemed to suggest that the car had skidded off Lake Lanier Bridge on Dawsonville Highway and into the lake below. Yet, they couldn't find any vehicle. Divers who were brought in to search for the car were unable to locate it due to the poor visibility. 
in the murky water and the masses of shredded off tree trunks that litter the lake's bottom. For 18 months, police were unable to find any further clues and no trace of the missing woman or the car. But then, like in Kelly's case, a fisherman made a gruesome discovery when the decomposed body of what was thought to be that of Delia Parker Young suddenly floated out of the depths. Oddly, the corpse, which could not be completely positively identified at the time, was missing two toes from the left foot, and both hands were missing. Lord. Yeah. The body of Susie Roberts, her friend, and the car remain missing, despite numerous searches. Now, it's said that this mystery would go on for decades until November of 1990 when the construction of an expansion of Lake Lanier Bridge was underway. As construction crews were dredging the bottom of the lake in order to set up pillars for the expansion, they uncovered, you guessed it, a rusted out hull of a 1954 Ford, which held within it the remains of a human body. The car had been hidden within tree trunks, mud, and other debris in 90 feet of water on a steep slope. Again, the body was so decomposed that it was not identifiable, but the belongings found on it were able to conclusively prove the body was that of Susie Roberts. So, how does that happen? Because that, where that car is found is nowhere near the bridge they supposedly went off of. Hmm. I got nothing, man. <laughs> now, there are some other weird shit that goes on in Lake Lanier. Local fishermen have long insisted that there are gigantic catfish in the lake, which reportedly reach the size of five to seven feet long and are said to swallow dogs that get too close to the water and even bite swimmers and divers. Yeah, but I mean, isn't that like a... A rumor or a myth, and pretty much everywhere a lake is because. Well, I've heard it on every. Same, you heard it where? I said I've heard it on every bridge construction in every deep ass river ever made. So. Yeah, like my the Carter's Lake, close to me, is rumored to have gigantic catfish too. I think it's just a normal thing that people think. Or it's possible that they all have them. I don't know. I don't go scuba diving in creepy ass lakes. No, I used to scuba dive, but it was in the great ocean where I could see long, long ways away. And they tried to do like a navigational dive one day in the seaweed. And I was only in six feet of water. And the navigational dive was supposed to take no longer than 15 minutes. I had 120 pounds of air in my tank. By the time I finished that 15 minutes, I had sucked that puppy dry. Oh, wow. Yeah, I don't like not being able to see. Just like when you were in prison. Sucked or dry. <laughs> <laughs> Got to survive, man. Got to survive. <laughs> hey, man, that commissary don't pay for itself. That's right, baby. Them Cheetos ain't free, buddy. <laughs> now, these giant catfish, back to the story, are said to be attracted to the deep waters below the Buford Dam. And if you believe the rumors, the corpse that were not removed from the cemeteries. Now, one of them said that one of the tales concerned a truck carrying live chickens, which supposedly drove off the Thompson Bridge in the 80s and sank to the bottom along with its cargo. Divers mm-hmm. were sent in to examine the wreckage and to their horror found not one, not two, not even three or four, but five to eight catfish the size of 12-year-old boys gathered around the sunken truck engaged in a ravenous feeding frenzy. Okay, first of all, what kind of unit of measurement is that? 12-year-old boy, I don't know. Americans will use anything but the metric system. (laughs) Yeah. How big do you think he was? Well, he was about the size of a 12-year-old. Well, I mean, an average 12-year-old, small for his size 12-year-old. And 12-year-olds aren't that big. That's not really that huge of a fish. I mean, I've seen big catfish. True. Eh, I don't know, man. But, God, what a unit of measurement that is. <laughs> it's like, 
Yes. Other stories have described fishermen hooking into some of these enormous catfish and having their boats towed around the lake like ski ropes. Oh, like on at the end of Grumpier Old Men when they get catfish yeah, yeah, hunter yeah, and they yeah, get yes, pulled yes, around. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, classic movie if you hadn't seen it. He's like, <laughs> he's like, just give me the, uh, just throw the anchor. He's like, you cut the anchor. He says, screw the anchor. Just give me the net. He's like, you cut the net too, you dickhead. Look at it. <laughs> uh, now, one of the last things I'll go over is the Lady of the Lake, and they said that Delia and Susie haunt the lake until their bodies were found. Um, See, that's that's not a unique story either. There was plenty of Lady of the Lakes. Now, going back to your... we got to get original, Georgia. Come on, people. Going back to your thing about the Cherokee, it says that Lake Lanier is definitely one of the deadliest underwater surfaces in America, but before it was built, it does mostly reside in Forsyth County, Georgia, and if you don't know anything about the history of Forsyth County, Georgia, it used to be a sundown county. Yeah, it was. Look up Oprah Winfrey, Forsyth, Forsyth County, Georgia, on YouTube, and you'll find a very interesting video. Mm. She went down there to find out what was going on, and man, it was. She was not met with uh, sweet crazy. tea and crumpets. If you don't know what a sundown town is, you're very fortunate. Yes, and you but, will need to look that up because I don't. Yeah, we're not going to discuss it here, but it's no. not a good thing. No, it is not a good thing. Now, as Coach alluded to, it was part of the Cherokee Nation until the 1830s, and that's when they were, how'd you say it? Voluntold. Voluntold. To get yeah, out. Yeah, voluntold. And that is the southeasternmost or, uh, start of the Trail of Tears over there. Now, over the next 80 years, the county became re-inhabited, including a thriving black community of approximately 1,100 people. In September of 1912, as most stupid shit that gets kicked off back then does, a white woman was raped and murdered in the town known as Oscarville. The crime was pinned on four black people who lived in the town. Ernest Knox, 16, Oscar Daniel, 18, Trusty Jane Daniel, Oscar's sister, 22, and Robert Big Rob Edwards, 24. Days after their arrest, the Edwards were lynched by a mob in his jail cell who shot him, dragged him through the streets, and hung him from a telephone pole. This display of violence was only the beginning because around Forsyth County, white mobs known as the Night Riders would go on violent sprees, burning black churches and businesses, and threatening to do worse if all black residents didn't leave the town immediately. Basically, over time, the black community gave in and fled, leaving most of their possessions behind. They did try Ernest Knox and Oscar Daniel for the rape in 1912, and some 5,000 people gathered to watch them hang... And many believe that they were innocent. In 1950, the U.S. government approved the Buford Dam, like we said. But if you make the Cherokee leave and people are running around and make a whole town of black residents of numbering upwards of 1,100 leave, that land ain't going to be very fertile if you get what I'm laying down. That land going to be haunted. Oh, yeah. Here's uh-huh. what's even stupider. They gave an 81-year-old far, uh, ferryman who sold his 100-acre farm to the government $4,100 cash. That's it? For 100 They gave him $41 an acre. In what year, though? What did you say? What year? Nineteen forty-eight. Forty dollars an acre. Yeah. I guarantee you, they paid more than that for some of the businesses they drowned. I don't know, man. They said that this article states that of those twenty cemeteries that I 
referenced earlier, not all of those were moved. Yeah. So I'm just going to be honest with you. If you happen to go up there or you ever thought about going striper fishing in Lake Lanier, don't. Go down to the Flint River like Luke Bryan says and fish your heart yeah. content. <laughs> Go to Lake Altoona, man, and see where they filmed Ozark. What's that movie that Ben Affleck played, the autistic guy that was like the cleaner, the accountant? Is it the yeah, I think it's it. called The Accountant, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, at the end of that movie, when he's picking up his, uh, oh, I can't think of the dang camper now. There, it's that aluminum looking skin one. It's a specific name. Anyway, when he's pulling that camper, he's driving across uh, Lake Altoona too in the winter time over. But anyway, uh, if you are interested in the crazy history of Lake Lanier, there are many, many a uh, YouTube out there that you can ponder on. There's plenty of articles that you can look at, but like I said, I was not going to do none of that. So, Coach, you got anything else about Lake Lanier? I believe you know that I do not. I didn't have anything to begin with. <laughs> Except the Cherokee. <laughs> Come through with the Cherokee. Well, my um, people were a little perturbed that the timing of my Mara Murray joke was not uh, recognized by you in, in a fashion in which would have made it funnier. So you what? Need, what? Who said what? <laughs> you need to make sure that you pay, you're paying attention. Who said? What they say? They what are you said, saying? They said you that that was a damn good joke wasted on having to repeat it. <laughs> I'm, I'll admit it was, but no, I'm sorry. Life happens, man. I can't help. I can't pay attention to your ass the whole time we're talking. It just yeah, don't. that Candy Crush game is calling your name. <laughs> It's not conducive to my sanity. You're funny once every four episodes, and I happen to miss it. I'm sorry. You mean I got a face for radio? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, you do. we definitely do, both of us. <laughs> Speaking of which, did our mutual friend Heater send you the picture of that guy holding up that big mountain lion that he had uh... – Killed. Yeah, he said he thought it was me. I was like, yeah. that dude's way too skinny to be me, brother. Well, you can't really see the size of the man holding the cat up, but the face, if I had been drinking a little bit, I would have swore that was you. It wasn't, man. You ain't seeing me out hunting. I promise you that much. All right. Well, what's your recommendation, sir? I'm looking at it right now. I just looked at it. That is definitely not me. <laughs> well, I would hope you would know if you killed a mountain lion as big as that son of a gun. That dude is what? No, I'm way prettier than that guy. Way prettier. I don't know about that. I'm very pretty for a man. I'm just saying. Well, the women, <laughs> the women do. I mean, when he goes through the crystal drive-through, he has to wade through the panties in his party Prius. Man, you want to catch me dead at crystal drive-through? You, I might not catch you dead, but I could catch your ass drunk there. <laughs> well, no, I take that back. You, you'd be at Taco Bell across the street. Absolutely. <laughs> Gordita. <laughs> All right, so what's, <laughs> what's, what's your recommendation? I recommend that you get somebody to listen to our podcast, somebody to join our Facebook group where I'm posting the most hilarious memes known to man. And occasional scare, uh, spooky articles. So, and tell a friend, you know, get somebody to listen, man. We need some more listeners. Telephone, tell a friend. That's right. That's my recommendation. All right. So my recommendation, let me find it again. Cause I wanted to, uh, what is it? No, 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 no. My history. I want my my history, son. My history. It's the Soft White Underbelly YouTube channel, but he interviews a lady, Ruth, from Appalachia. She's 86 years old, and y'all, she is the cutest 
like old woman. She reminds me of my grandmother, and she will probably remind you of someone elderly in your family. She has some of the most honest answers to life, to questions that he poses to her, and it really is a feel-good story. It's about 25 minutes if you watch the whole thing. She's kind of gained a little bit of uh, notoriety on the old TikTok. There's about a three-minute video that someone has cut from the original interview with her talking about how she she either drinks lukewarm jello or she has a cup of jello a night and that's why she's still so limber as a dish rag and I was dying laughing. Well you should uh you should send uh send a link man post it on the on the private group bro. I will bro. I was trying to find the link but YouTube's gotten crazy now and they just want to start playing videos in the middle of you clicking on the app so but anyway I will post that link, and it is worth it. If you've never watched any of the Soft White Underbelly, um, there are many a playlist, and I would tell you a cautionary tale. Do not just pick one at random. There are things on there that you may not want to lay your eyes upon. But his interview with Miss Ruth in Appalachia is a very feel-good story, so... That's my recommendation. Well, Coach, you got anything else? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> shit. Uh, deuces.